Hey, this is Aaron Walker, founder of View From The Top. You're listening to On Face Edge with Joe Taylor. What he's able to give us, the strength to hold together, he never tests us to have us fail. He tests us to show the character of our of our lives. What kind of people we're made of when you strip away all this stuff. That's our God. Thanks, Aaron Walker, for the introduction. Aaron is a highly successful entrepreneur that has faced amazing tragedy and triumph on his road to success. You can hear our conversation at onfaithsedge.com slash 57. That's onfaithsedge.com slash 57. Well, hello. Welcome to the 89th episode of On Faith's Edge. My name is Joe Taylor, recovering atheist and your servant in Jesus Christ. This is your place to hear conversations about God and living a life of faith in Jesus Christ. Author Bill Combs is with us today. You'll hear us talk about the Garden of Eden in his new book based on the Garden of Eden, where self-esteem comes from, and he shares raw emotions during our discussion about his relationship with his now past wife, Miriam. I really love bringing you engaging conversations about faith. If this show entertains you, encourages you, informs you, or brings value to you in any way whatsoever, will you consider financially backing the show? The best way to do that now is to use any Amazon link at onfaithsedge.com. We'll get a modest commission and uh, it doesn't cost you a penny more. Congratulations to listener Billy Lockmiller. Billy, you'll receive a free copy of Natasha Owens' CD, We Will Rise. Natasha, of course, was on the last episode of On Faith's Edge. Billy, just shoot me an email at joe at onfaithsedge.com, and I'll get your CD right out to you. Nearly 90,000 books on Amazon deal with self-esteem, and antidepressants in society today are absolutely rampant. Mental health disorders such as depression or anxiety are becoming more and more commonplace. Today's guest, author Bill Combs, isn't surprised by these statistics because he believes deep down every person feels inadequate, what he calls naked. By taking readers all the way back to the life of Adam and Eve in the garden, Combs explores this feeling of being incomplete and vulnerable and finds fresh ways of looking at who we are in his just released book, Who Told You That You Were Naked? A Refreshing Reexamination of the Garden of Eden. In our conversation, we look at a different perspective of the story of the Garden of Eden. We talk about when did God actually identify sin? Was Adam and Eve's disobedience in the Garden of Eden actually a well-intended attempt at being closer to God? What is naked from God's perspective? And how caring for Miriam, his wife of 48 years during her illness and eventual death, changed his life and his perspective of God? I I want to give you a, a fair warning here. This conversation becomes very personal and emotional, and it may be the most important part of our talk. Bill specifically asked that we release this segment as is with all of its raw emotion. In fact, after our conversation, I said, hey, Bill, I'm more than happy to edit that this part out. But he said, no, no, Joe, keep it in. Tell us about who told you you were naked. Most of us look at the Garden of Eden through the eyes of the New Testament and we think, well, you know, Adam and Eve, uh, they ate that fruit and and they sinned against God's command and we've been sinners ever since and that's how it got into the human race and, and woe is me, you know. I learned so much about the Old Testament through the eyes of the New Testament. It's still good to go back to the Old Testament and find out what, you know, what it says about things because... Some people are surprised to find out that God didn't use the word sin until the fourth chapter of Genesis when he was talking to to Adam's oldest son, Cain, about his attitude towards Abel. Hmm. He didn't use sin when he was talking to Adam and and Eve about what they did in the garden. You'd think that, you know, if it was about sin, as we think it is, oh, he should have used the word back then, but he didn't, see? He actually... They gained the knowledge of good and evil, and good and evil is more than just the ability to tell the difference between right and wrong. Okay, there's a lot more to it than that. Because when they, when they both ate the, the fruit, it said their eyes were opened, and what, what happened when their eyes were opened? They, they recognized they were naked, or some of my southern friends say naked, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> they were naked. And what does that mean? 
because they were naked all along, right? So it's an inner per- per- perception of something different now. They're using that knowledge of good and evil to compare their individual differences with each other. And they say, I'm naked. Now, if you've had an experience of feeling naked, I'll give you two examples. One is, I bet you've all had, a, both of you have had a dream in which you're out in public in your birthday suit, right? Right. And you know how that feels? It's not because you, feel, you did something wrong. It's just that I'm out here all exposed and I want to get back inside and cover up, you know? That's, that's the feeling of being naked. There's something I don't, I want to hide. You know, I don't feel, I don't feel like I'm okay out there. And yet, sometimes when you're in your bedroom and you're getting undressed, going to take a shower or, or getting ready for bed, and your pet is there, your dog or your cat, you don't feel naked in its presence, do you? That's a good point. And it's because you don't feel like this animal is able to look at you with that kind of look, you know? <laughs> judgment. Right. And actually, that judgment is coming from inside you because when Paul says there's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, that condemnation is really coming from within us. So when Adam and Eve covered themselves up and they felt okay for a while until God came into the garden that afternoon, like he always did, and all of a sudden they looked at him and they compared their individual differences with him and it was clear off the chart, right? And they felt scared and, and they ran and hid. God, God said, Adam, where are you? And Adam said, they came sheepishly out from behind the sycamore trees and they said, I was afraid because I broke your command and I was, a, I was convinced you were going to kill me. No, that's not what he said. He said, I was afraid because I was naked. Well, now, wait a minute. God made them naked, so he didn't mind them being naked. There were only three people in the garden that day. Adam, his wife, and, and, Adam, and, and, and God. So God's trying to tell Adam, by the use of the word, who told you were naked? He was trying to ask him to look at himself and say, it's you, Adam, that's, that, that has this opinion of yourself. It's not me. Now, yes, you... you you, you defied my law. That's true. But the consequence was this feeling that you have because you gained a knowledge that you shouldn't have. That you, I didn't make you for that. And so when the, when the book of Proverbs says, rely, trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't rely on your own understanding. And when Paul says, don't be conformed to this world, but be renewed by the be, be re, con, transformed by the renewing of your what mind, and your whole nature thus transformed. You see, we have to become. We have two things. We have to have to get changed because of this this fallen garden. Number one is our transgressions have to be taken care of, and the only way that's going to be trans, taken care of is if we. God loved us so much that he take, took our transgressions and put them on his son because he is a righteous God. He has to take care of them. So he gave them to his son. His son died for them, uh, for us on the cross. Okay, but there's another problem. Not, not only that we get our righteousness from him, but the other problem is how are we going to fix this mind that we've messed up, right? And so it says, let your mind be remade. It doesn't say make your mind over. Go, go to school and get a good education and, and that'll take care of it. No, he didn't say, you can't remake your mind. I will have to remake it with you and for you. Let your mind, that's a passive tense word. Let your minds be remade. That's, the word is metamorphosis. It's, it's like the caterpillar becoming a butterfly. God wants you to become the butterfly that he's made you to be, Right? Let your mind be remade and your whole nature thus transformed. He's trying to make you into the mind of Christ. He's going to give you his son's mind. Now, what, how does it do it? He says, when you walk in the light as he is in the light, what happens? You have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you from all sin. What's he doing? He's, he's going into your life all these habits and and things that keep tripping you up all the time, he's saying, let me take care of that. 
I'll show you another way of doing it. I'll help you. I'll give you. Let go of that, okay? Paul says, die to sin and live for God. You can't fight sin if you're in a pine box, right? So he says, if you die to sin, that means you're not, you're not trying to, to solve your own habits. You're not trying to, he says, put it aside, let it go and, and focus on me and I'll take care of it. See, because we were made in his image. If I hold up a mirror to you, right, you see that, well, we're like a mirror. And when we focus on God, God's reflection refocuses on through us. We start mirroring his image in us. And he starts remaking us as we walk with him. Now what go you're ahead. Right, you write something very interesting in your in your book, Bill. You you write that you think Adam and Eve's disobedience was actually well intended. Yeah, well, if, here's my question on that. Sure, go if ahead. If that was the case, if it was indeed well intended, and God knew Adam's heart, and he knew Eve's heart, uh, why would God punish them and to the point of banishing them okay. from the Garden of Eden? Good point. Absolutely good point. Because you said several things. He didn't punish them. God is God is a God of love. He wants to redeem us. Okay. Now, when he asked Adam, who told you you were naked? He wanted Adam to realize that it was, it was internal, okay? You know, my, my view on this, and I, and I guess I'd have to look back into the story. Sure. But I bet you know the answer. My thought was, well, Satan told him he was naked. The, 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 the serpent told Adam that he was naked. Or that that process informed Adam of his nakedness. Uh, but I hear what you're saying, Bill. God was trying to draw from Adam, if I'm right. God was trying to draw from Adam the understanding that, Adam, you're telling yourself That's right. that you're naked. Yeah, no. Let's, let's go back to Eve and her situation with the serpent. The serpent said to Eve, you'll become just like God, knowing good and evil. Now, they were the two most innocent people this planet has ever seen, okay? Do you have children, Joe? We do. Okay. We do. If your girls came to you and your, and your wife and said, you know what? We want to be just like you and dad when we grow up. Would you look at that as an insult? No. Would you hate them and want to punish them? No. Okay. When God, when, when, when Eve heard those words and when she turned around and told her husband the same thing, we can be just like dad, right? We can be just like our Abba father. We can be more like our dad, our father in heaven who comes and visits us every single day. We can become more like him. Yeah, I want that. Yeah, I want that. And they took it. Now, Adam wanted to protect his wife. <laughs> okay? So God said to Adam, don't eat the fruit. What did Eve, he tell Eve? Don't even touch it. Because when she told the serpent, she said, we can't even touch this fruit lest we die. Well, where did she get that from? It certainly wasn't from God because you can't eat something without touching it. So obviously he didn't tell him not to touch it. So it must have been, he wanted to keep her away from the tree altogether. So don't even get near it, my dear. He was afraid that she might inadvertently pick some fruit and put it in her basket and take it back and we would eat it in a salad or something. So he says, stay away from it. You know, completely stay away from it. That's why they never ate from the tree of, the, of, the, of, the, of life either. You know, because it was right next to the tree of life. I'm not saying it, that that's the reason why they didn't, but that's a plausible bit. Situation, but we know that she had that idea. But when she, when she was asked that, she said, I was tricked by this serpent. Well, it's not that they were holding their fists up and said, We finally, you know, you kept us away from this tree and we hate this and we're rebelling. That's not true. That was the only tree that they were asked not to deal with, right? Everything else is cornucopia of, of, of 
food and, and wonder was theirs. They had to live by faith too, so he told them, here's something that you have to obey, right? That's a part of being faithful. But when they did this, Adam could have said, you know, okay, the serpent said this. Well, maybe the serpent's right. Adam's failure was, he didn't say, you know what? Let's ask the Lord this afternoon when we see him, see if the serpent's right. Mm. Adam didn't do that. Instead, he said, okay, <laughs> you know, you know, okay. He gave in, you know. That's a really interesting perspective. And, and honestly, that's not a perspective on, on the Garden of Eden in the story of the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve that I, that I had heard. That the idea that uh, there, this was, this may have been, let's say it that way, this may have been a completely innocent act on, Ex for, by, by Adam and Eve. Except that they knew that God said don't do it. Right. Right. So she got tricked into it into thinking they would become more like him. So that overruled the situation at that point. Right. Justified it. Rationalized yeah. it. Right. Rationalized it. Right. Yeah. And they were very rational people because, remember, Adam named all the animals. He's a very intelligent person. So is she. How does understanding or re-understanding this story uh, and in fact, your book, you call it a refreshing re-examination of the Garden of Eden. How does this re-examination of the Garden of Eden help a Christian and witness to other Christians? Right. Uh, be a better husband. Well, I'm glad you uh, asked. Be a better father. Uh, be, a, uh, be a better member of society. How does, how does re-examining re and, and re-understanding the Garden of Eden and the story of the Garden of Eden and all the vulnerability... Uh, that comes with it. How does it help that Christian? Understand if we come as witness, as, as we try to witness our faith, share our faith with others, if what we're, our primary message is, you're a sinner, you need to repent of your sins and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's half of it, okay? That's true, no doubt about it. But, if we also start with who told you that you were too old or too heavy or you didn't have a good enough education or as a young person you had too many zits, who told you that you, you feel this way, who, that you feel vulnerable or insecure and how many times do you have people come to you and, and they can't look at you in the eye you know, because they don't feel right about themselves. And you want to reach out in the same kind of compassion that Jesus reached out to people who were quote unquote sinners. I came to save not the righteous, but the sinners. He never called those people sinners. He reached out to their vulnerabilities and their anxieties, you know, called, called Zacchaeus from the tree, you know, climbed up in the tree and said, Zacchaeus, I have to eat with you today. He's a tax collector. Everybody hated tax collectors just like they do today, right? Zacchaeus, I have to eat with you today. He didn't say, Zacchaeus, you've been hosing people all your life. You got to pay these people back, double over. No, he never said this. It's, Zacchaeus, I have to eat with you today. Zacchaeus came crawling out of that tree says, what, you paying attention to me? You mean you, a Jew, a prophet in our land, are paying attention to me? And all of a sudden it changed his whole life because now here's somebody that's saying, to everybody else thinks it's important, thinks I'm important too. And so when we start reaching out that way to people, what happens? The Holy Spirit now has an opportunity to deal with their lives, just like he did with Zacchaeus, and what did Zacchaeus say? Right here and now, I'm going to give half of my life, half of my prop to the to, to the poor, and I'm going to. If I've messed up anybody's life by what I've done, I'll, I'll repay double. We Jesus did. didn't say that; he did. Isn't that wonderful? How he can work that way? Just just understanding the, these foundational principles taught 
uh, in Genesis is indeed a refreshing that to know that this 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 nakedness that we feel is okay. Our nakedness is our perception of nakedness. Our perception that we're not quite okay in in comparison with somebody else. And it it allows me to love other people because God has loved me. He mm. thinks I'm important. And, well, can we talk a little bit about your personal faith? Sure. How did you come to believe in Jesus Christ? Well, um, Bill Bright of Campus Crusade came to our, our college when I was a senior. And if you know anything about Bill Bright, he, uh, he preached on the four spiritual laws. And I, uh, I went up afterwards and said, I was raised a Catholic. And so I said, well, you know, I'm going to have to go down here to, uh, to, to um, confess my sins and get myself cleaned up for him. I'm going to ask the Lord into my life. You know, he says, trust me, he'll take care of that. So we went into a practice room and, and I knelt down and accepted the Lord. It's still, you know, and it changed my life. It changed my life because uh, I, I was constantly struggling inside to be accepted because I was a farm boy, okay? From a little rural town, a little country boy, you know? And the city kids never accepted me, you know, in school. I always felt like I was on the outside. And then when I went from a small rural town of Wasilla, Alaska, where Sarah Palin became the, became the, she became the, 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 the mayor of that town when my brother John was the mayor of Palmer right next door. Wow. <laughs> But that's, but I was raised there when, when Palma was 108 people counting dogs and chickens, okay? And, and she, she was over a much bigger town than that. That's much larger. Well, you know, I was out eight miles out of town and the, and the, and the kids that I went to school with, Larry Thielen, Thielen Shopping Center and, and, and Helen Carter, her, her mom was a postmaster. They were, the people in town, you know, because there was only about five buildings in town at that point. So I had to get on the bus and go home, right? They got to stay in town and they had a nice little click there. You know, it was all, everything was wonderful in town. I was not a part of it. So I was, I was, and when there was only 15 in my eighth grade graduating class. So mom and dad wanted me to go to Palmer High School where it was 50 or 60 kids in the class. I get a much better education. Well, when I moved from Wasilla to Palmer, the kids in Wasilla hated the people in Palmer and vice versa. So <laughs> here I am in Palmer, a hated kid. And by the way, I skipped a grade. So I was a little, little boy. I was four feet, eight inches tall going into high school. Wow. By then, of course, it was too late. You know, my, my self-esteem had been pretty well set. So I could hardly wait to get out of high school because I, you know, I didn't have hardly any friends. Part, a lot of us, because of my own attitude toward who I was. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm an outsider. So when Bill Bright said that and I accepted the Lord in my life, his peace and his security and his person came to live with me. And I could rest. And it just changed everything. In fact, people, my, the person I married actually invited me to go to Bill Bright's conference. Wow. And, you know, Bill, Bill went to, Bill went, went to the, went, went to the crusade last night. And this guy said, is he the one? Cause she wouldn't go out with me. I really liked her, but she wouldn't go out with me before, you know? And I changed so much that uh, she, a couple of weeks later, said, uh, "Why don't you? Could you take me downtown? I need to go shopping. Would you say?" And we've been together ever since. How did caring for your wife, twenty-four hours a day, uh, for years, up until up, in, up until the day she died? How did that? How did that affect your faith? Now. Well, I tell you, I just lost her December 1st. 
I miss her terribly. But I've seen her three times since then, and she's young, and she's vital, and she's healthy, and she's just wonderful, okay? So I, I know she's okay. It's hard to miss your wife of 48 years. I'm sorry. Because she's everything to me. You know, the two most important relationships I have are over half a century old, and that's my relationship with the Lord and my relationship with Miriam. She had late-stage chronic Lyme disease, and we didn't discover it until fairly late, and because it wasn't even known as a disease until the mid-70s. And every time we asked the Lord, do we have children? He said, no. And I'm glad because the disease has passed through the placenta, and our kids would have had Lyme from their very beginning, and it, and it eats the lining around your nerves and the collagen in your, the gristle in your, so it, it destroys you in your nervous system, in your brain. So kids that are born with this are in really bad shape. Well, so the Lord protected us from that. But it also destroyed her. She probably got it when she was a kid. And her immune system kept it in bay until she had, a, she had a, an operation in the year 2010. And it just, it just took off. And... She went from walking six miles a day to not being able to walk at all and not being even able to talk or write because it affects your nerves. And she actually, she actually choked to death on food because she had a hard time swallowing. And so I, I found her and she, I had brought her a, a little bit of food, fruit, fruit for breakfast and I came in to pick up the, pick up the, the, the uh, dishes and she was gone and it was just horrible. I cried for three days and then the Lord started showing me all the things that he had brought us through all the time since, since we, before we were married up until that point and how he had guided us through all that time. Through all the heavy times and the hard times, because it wasn't easy. When you have this disease, it affects your, the, the, the neurotoxins make a person like autistic, autistic tendency. So she was like a five-year-old child with autism at times. And so she was very combative and screaming and hitting and everything else. It was hard. I knew it wasn't her. Okay, but it's still hard to live with. And I said, Lord, I feel like I feel like we're being sifted like wheat, just like Peter. And I said, Lord, help me because it's hard. It's hard to love this person when she's like this. And I, and I failed miserably at times. But the Lord in his grace and his mercy kept us going and kept us walking through and and when she was, and when she was normal, when she was out of it, she said, I don't know how you can stand to be around me. And I said, because I love you. And you'll never drive me away. But that's because the Lord gives you that kind of love, okay? Because it's hard. She, she couldn't sleep at night and she slept during the day when I had to be out. Uh, awake and going during the day and I had to try to sleep at night so it was I got maybe half hour of sleep at a time during the night for two or three years I only got three to four hours of sleep a night and it was all broken so it was wearing me down as well as hard but the Lord taught me in all of that how how merciful he is and how much he can he can sustain you through that kind of trauma it's not easy. There's a story within a story here. Yeah. We're here to talk about your book, Who Told You That You Were Naked. But your experience with your wife, 
During that time, did you doubt your faith? Did you doubt the existence of God or the goodness of God? Didn't doubt the existence of God. But you question, why is she staying like this? Okay. You know, when Peter says, I will never deny you that you're the Messiah, and Jesus turned around and said, Peter, before the cock crows, you're going to deny me three times. Did he say, Peter, get out of here. I don't want to have anything more to do with you. No, he said, you didn't choose me. I chose you. And he said to Peter, he said, I have prayed that your faith may not, what? Fail. And when you come to yourself again, <laughs> go help my brothers, your partners in this. And I feel like when he told me, you're being sifted as wheat, because that's what he told Peter at that point. You're being sifted as wheat. And you know, the, the, the chaff gets taken out when you sift it, so that the grain now is ready to be planted, okay? The chaff is there when the, when the grain is being developed, but after it's developed, you've got to take the chaff off in order for the, the, the wheat to be used. And I felt that was what the Lord was stripping things away from my life that were not necessary. It's things that I needed to get rid of before I went on. It's hard. And yes, I did question a lot. And looking back, I realize that he took her at the best possible time for both of us. Now, when I'm looking back, she's free. I'm sorry. She's free. And she's young. And she's... He's been able to give her everything I couldn't. You've never been on the other side. You think this side is wonderful? Yes, it is. Guys have not seen or ears heard the glorious things that God has prepared for those who love him. And she, my wife is free. Sorry. It's just too soon. <sighs> you know, Job question too. You know, why is this happening to me? I lost my kids. I lost everything. But when he got to the end, what did he say? I knew you then only by report, but now I see you face to face. Wow. Wow was right. What I've gained since then? And then the Lord gave him so much more. You know, that's the kind of God we have. We don't understand what's necessary for us to be made whole. Paul says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Oh, we love that. But then he says, in the depths of his suffering. <laughs> That's hard. And growing conformity with his death, that's even harder. That I too may attain the resurrection of the dead. That I too may become like him. Yeah, it's not easy, but wow. What he's able to give us, the strength to hold together. He never tests us to have us fail. He tests us to show the character of our, of our lives. What kind of people we're made of when you strip away all this stuff. That's our God. And what's, what, what comes out of that is gold, okay? It's a kind of personality that can go through anything. And I now can say thank you, Lord, that she is not only given 
all that I couldn't give her, but that you've also given me all that you couldn't give me except to take me through this. Your story is a beautiful story of faith and love and honor and perseverance. People will be changed by your story. Thank you. I don't think we can say anything more than what we've said. Well, the book is Who Told You That You Were Naked? A Refreshing Examination of the Garden of Eden and, and, by Bill Combs. And you can get it at any bookstore or through Amazon.com or, you know, and all it, all the profits of these book, this book and the audio book go to charity. And if you want a, a, an ebook or a Kindle book, you can go to who told you you were who told you that you were naked dot biz, and and you can download a free copy. I will certainly make sure that all of these links uh, are in today's show notes at onfaithsedge.com. Bill, thank you for being with us. Uh, thanks, Joe, for having me. God bless you, brother. God bless you. You can follow Bill at his website, who told you that you were naked.biz. That's who told you that you were naked.biz. That's B I Z dot biz. As Bill said, his book is available at Amazon.com. If you'll be kind enough to use the Amazon link in today's show notes, it won't cost you a penny more and we'll get a little help to run the show. All the links from today's show are at onfaithsedge.com slash 89. That's onfaithsedge.com slash 89. Again, congratulations to listener Billy Lockmiller. Billy, you'll receive a free copy of Natasha Owen's CD, We Will Rise. Shoot me an email at joe at onfaithsedge, and I'll get your CD right out to you. Well, that'll wrap up today's show. Thank you to Bill Combs for being with us, and thank you for listening. You mean a lot to me, and you mean a lot to the show. Remember, God is real. He loves you, and so do I. God bless. Thank you for listening to On Faith's Edge. You can subscribe to the show via iTunes, Stitcher Internet Radio, or your favorite podcast app on Android, Apple, or Windows devices. To reach out to Joe or leave comments about the show, visit onfaithsedge.com. You're important to us, and we would love to hear from you. 